whatever it is you're reading, whether it's a play, a novel, a poem, short story, um, the most important thing is you gotta let the author speak. And what do I, what do I mean by that? When you write papers for classes, what are you told in every English course about the tense that you use? Present. Why? Literature is living. It's living. It's living. It's a conversation. How do you have a conversation when you don't let the other side speak? This does get into politics. Well, I forget what, I think it's called like death of the author. I think you about that because like, there's been many like, for example, <coughs> books in the past where like, graphic novels that I've read before where like the author originally meant to be like, like this. Like the author originally meant it to be like this specific thing for you to do the character this way, but everyone's taking it like in a different direction. Because they as soon as the author publishes the work, they don't really get a say in how people get to read it. Well, according to Jacques Derrida the deconstructionist, right. that's the view. It's, it's the issue is once the authorial fallacy was introduced as an idea it opened up a huge section of ground for audience interpretation and understanding and how that influences what meanings we do perceive and derive. But it also, to its detriment, destroyed a lot of good criticism of literature. Because that happened just like recently, people are looking back into these stars the man who made a movie originally wanted to like make fun of like fascism and stuff like that. Yeah, but yeah. When people watch the movie, they see it more as like humanity overcoming like stuff. Or they just they Star Wars. Just, they just, just take it literally and not like as like an in-universe sort of satire of like fascist like propaganda. S Star Wars is, is very, very similar. Star Wars, you know, the original three, let's say, not all the nonsense that came in after. <laughs> Star Wars was, you know, this great battle, good versus evil this rebellion against this overarching empire, all that kind of stuff. Over the last 20 years, there's been a pretty broad swath of, I won't say which side, one side of American politics that takes the rebellion as traitors. And the empire is the good side. And I don't mean, you know, people who like um, Draco Malfoy and their Slytherin lovers and all that, I, I mean, relatively normal people. Back to the, you know, when I, when I asked about what, what tense to use, it's a conversation, okay? If you don't let Shakespeare speak, you can't have a conversation. If it's me forcing everything, okay, which is why I am, I am a free speech absolutist, which is why I hate when universities shut down speakers, whether from the left or from the right. This is the one place the only place in our society where all ideas ought to be able to be expressed. Even the most foul, disgusting, scum of the earth, so to speak, ideas. Why? Let those ideas be voiced by their best proponents and then let the other side by their, their best proponents. It used to be called a marketplace of ideas. Let the ideas, you know, marshal up. Take fight, you know, uh, set your, your troops in their ranks and let them go at it, so to speak. With, with an author like Shakespeare, with an author like Homer, Sophocles, all the way up to, you know, 20 or so years ago. We're, to get back to deconstruction for just a moment before we get back into Shakespeare, where does the meaning reside? How so? I mean, it is in our brains that we're able to like construct any sort of sense or meaning out of these like, you know, pieces of like ink on this paper, right? If you have papers, go ahead and pass them up or hand them up or bring them up, whichever. I I exactly, okay? So we interpret these marks, right? These whatever these things are on the page, okay? And we take that meaning, or you have just turned in your meaning, and what do I do from it? I take this, and I run it through my processor, and what you all hope 
is that what you process down here makes it 100% up here. And if it doesn't, there's either faulty processing here or there's faulty processing here, okay? In other words, the meaning doesn't reside solely here. The meaning doesn't reside solely here. The meaning doesn't reside solely here. It is what author and reader both make of it. One of you mentioned the death of the author idea. Does that mean an author cannot make comments about his or her work after it is written? No, it does not mean that. According to Jacques Derrida on the deconstructionists, it does. Deconstructionists say, once you've written a text, it is out there for others to do whatever they want with, within reason. You, you can't read Hamlet and say, you know, Hamlet's about Martians. It, clearly not. It, what you say about it has got to be based upon the text. The flaw in the deconstructionist argument is there would not be this without you. <laughs> there would not be this without Shakespeare. In the real, I think, you know, the coup de grace that shows the falsity of deconstruction, shortly before his death, eh, five or ten years before his death, Derrida took a guy to court copyright infringement. If you're going to author the death of the author, you can't claim copyright. Because once you, you, each one of you, have copyright over this. Even though you don't file it with anybody, it is written under your names. If I were to take an idea that one of you, say one of you has an absolutely brilliant idea, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm taking that. And I were to publish that as mine, what is it? It's not a copyright infringement. It's plagiarism, even though it is not published. It's not my idea to take, okay? You can't have plagiarism if there's the death of the author, period, all right? Um, which gets me back to this, just real quickly, to give you an idea of what everybody did. First part of Henry the Fourth, second part, heavy lies the golden crown, the art of manipulation. Purpose and method of both King Henry and Prince Hal's manipulation, public and privates, and analysis of Henry the Fourth parts one and two, personae as the influence of public perception, public and privates. It's the same one. Uh, yeah, it's my second copy. Um, public versus private persona of how in Shakespeare's one and two, Henry the fourth. That's my misreading the title. Uh, Henry the fourth, manual for monarchs. How's, character development. Another manual for monarchs by Henry the one, four and two, Henry four. I already did that one. Okay, so. Let's pick up with Hamlet. And let's see what he says. We left off, Act 3, Scene 1. Towards the end, Hamlet is talking with Ophelia. Right? Now, this is right after, we're going to pick up right after Ophelia hands the papers back to Hamlet, or attempts to hand papers back to Hamlet, telling him when he says, I didn't give you anything. She says, you know right well you did, and with them words of so sweet breath composed has made the things more rich. That is, hers, his sweet breath made just the regular plain old meaning on the papers what? More meaningful. How? Because she's taking the spirit in which they were written. Love. Their perfume lost. Take these again. What does she mean by their perfume lost? It's not that the intention that was behind them is now gone. 
Bingo. And what does that do? It changes the meaning. Read something now, whatever ages you are, read it again in five years, read it again five years after that, read it again five years after that, read it again five years after that. Or if there's something that you have a favorite that you read over and over and over and over again, you will probably start to notice every time you reread it, you pen peel off one more layer of the onion. Whatever it is gets deeper and deeper and deeper every time you read it, okay? For her, there is no more depth in this. She says, take these again, they're perfume lost, why? For to the noble mind, rich gifts wax poor when givers prove unkind. To the noble mind, who is she saying has a noble mind? She does. And she's saying, these were rich gifts. But now they aren't. Why? Now they've turned poor, meaning they lack meaning. They lack substance. Why? Because now she perceives Hamlet to have been an unkind giver. Unkind, both not nice and not natural. What has changed? between the time when Hamlet originally gave them and now. Anything else? We have the one. Hamlet's attitude is different. OK. In this scene, we see Hamlet's attitude different. That one scene in the bedroom. The one scene when Hamlet comes into a room See, to me, that is one of the most beguiling questions about the play. It's a, it's a small, small scene. From what we see in Act 1, when Hamlet says, I'm going to put on an antic disposition at times, we're not told when, we're not told why. Question is, to me at least, why does he do that? Now, it could be that the answer to that is going to be given very shortly. That Ophelia is going to say some stuff about Hamlet that if we take it for, its, for what it says there and possibly use that as a key to read back, that she's giving us an insight into Hamlet's mind that enables us to then go, oh, so now maybe if we look, use this perception of Hamlet to understand Hamlet from the beginning of the play, that will change our perception. So, here, I don't want them anymore. They don't mean anything anymore. You were just trying to get in my pants, essentially, okay? Hamlet, <laughs> Notice it begins with a laugh. Are you honest? What does he mean by honest? Your gloss tells you. Two meanings in Shakespeare's day. Truthful, obviously, and chaste. Chaste, sexually chaste. My lord, what the hell are you talking about? And if you watch Kenneth Branagh's version, it makes assumptions. It makes assumptions that she is not chaste because there are scenes with she and Hamlet having sex. Chastity outside marriage is not chastity. Excuse me. Sex outside marriage is not chaste in the traditional Christian sense. Okay? So you, she can't have, be having sex and be chaste. She can be chaste within marriage, have sex like a buddy. Okay? My lord, like, where are you going with this? Are you fair? So are you truthful and honest? Are you fair? your gloss tells you, beautiful and just and honorable. Are you truthful? Are you sexually chaste? Are you beautiful? Are you just? Are you honorable? Well, she has just said, to the noble mind, rich gifts wax poor. That idea of nobility in that word noble, that implies all of these things. OK? 
Okay? What do you mean, your lordship? Where are you going with this, Hamlet? If this were me, you know, grading Hamlet's speech, I'd be going, huh? But she, you know, uses better language than I do. Hamlet, here's what I mean. If you be honest and fair, if you be truthful, chaste, beautiful, noble, just, uh, honorable, just, your honesty, again, truthfulness, I'm going to keep replacing those words, should admit no discourse to your beauty. No discourse. What's meant by discourse? It's not talk. It's intercourse, like human relationships, not sexual intercourse. Being with someone, talking with them, human relationship, okay? So what's he saying? Your honesty should admit no discourse to your beauty. And she's like, wait a second. This is a philosophical issue. I need to think about this. Could beauty, my lord, have better commerce than with honesty? We think commerce means financial transaction. It's not what it means. It means relationship. Okay? So, could beauty have better commerce than with honesty? Shouldn't beauty and honesty, she's suggesting, go together? Shouldn't beauty be truthful? What was it? Keith? 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 Shelly? I always get the two things up. Beauty is truth. Truth, beauty. That is all you need to know. Okay? I'm not going to say which one because I keep going back and forth. Um, he says, truly. Good point. You've read your philosophy. You understand. These are the great ideas, you know. Truly, for the power of beauty will sooner transform honesty from what it is, truthfulness, chastity, okay? So, the power of beauty, beauty's influence over others, this is a common theme during the Renaissance, John Dunn writes about it quite a bit, will sooner, that kind of means quickly, immediately, transform honesty from what it is, to a bod. What's a bod? We don't use that term anymore. Pimp. A madam. It'll turn truthfulness and chastity to a procurer of flesh. What's another word that we've seen in the play that refers to that? Fish a fishmonger. Okay. Then the force of honesty so we've, we're comparing the power of beauty with the force of honesty, truthfulness, chastity, can translate beauty <coughs> into his likeness. This was sometimes a paradox. Why? Because it's still a paradox in terms of our minds when you read that. It's like, it's one of those truths that it takes you a while to really think about it. Something that is paradoxical is something that on first blush looks to be oxymoronic, can't be true at the same time, but ultimately see that it is true. But now the time gives it proof. That is, now beauty does what? It leads one astray. Beauty doesn't lead one to the higher ideals, okay? Why is he saying Remember his first speech? Oh, that this tutu sully flesh? I never made this connection before. It just clicked. Who does he compare in that speech? His father, Hamlet Sr., who he, whom he calls Hyperion, the sun god of the Titans, to a satyr. Okay? Why? What's between Hyperion and the satyr in that speech? What, what links the two? Like you know, you know? No. My, my analogy might be too, too broad. It's like there are two points of a, of a triangle. Where's the other point? What's the thing that, link, thing that links Hamlet Sr., Claudius, Gertrude? 
What's happened to her beauty? With Hyperion, Hamlet Sr., Hamlet says he could not be keen the winds enough to stop blowing her beautiful hair. With Claudius, it's what? Rank in semen sheets. This is an idealized form. Obviously, obviously, it wasn't just an idealized relationship because there is little Hamlet. <laughs> Actually, not so little. But with the others, or with Gertrude in Claudius, Hamlet's saying that's all sex. So, now the time gives it proof. I did love you once. No, it's did once are both doing what? Past tense. It's emphatic. Okay? Indeed, my Lord, you made me believe so. Again, past tense. Okay? And notice the verb she uses. She doesn't say, indeed, my Lord, I did believe so. It's you made a lot's been written about Ophelia and agency. Does she have agency? This implies you made me makes me what? Okay, what else? Passive. She's the passive recipient. Like Hamlet foisted this belief on her. He didn't literally, right? How did he? With these tenders of his uttered with almost all the holy vows of heaven, she told her father, okay? You should not have believed me. What does that mean? I lied to you. You shouldn't have, I mean, I'm a man, I only want one thing. You should not have believed me, why? For virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock but we shall relish of it. What the hell is he talking about? Virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock. The verb inoculate, I want to see what, what's the name gives us a gloss there. Virtue cannot be grafted onto our sinful condition without our retaining some taste of the old stock. And, okay, so, you have a tree, you cut that tree, you cut that stalk, and you graft, I think I've used this image before, if not in here, in my other classes, you graft a new branch onto that, or a new trunk onto that, okay? And what that does is, let's say, this is a pear tree, I've got a tree like this at home, and this is an apple tree. Guess what you're going to get from that tree? You're going to get pears and apples. I've got a tree at home called the fruit cocktail tree. Supposedly. It's never, we, you can tell by the different blossoms, the different leaves, we just never had the different fruit. It's peach, plum, and apricot. If, if, if we got all the fruits, so far we've only been getting plums. But you can tell by looking at it, because like, had apple, uh, apricot trees growing up, that part of it is clearly apricot by the leaves and the bark, etc. Part of it is clearly pear, uh, peach, part of it is clearly plum and such. So this, take this off, this is the old stock. What does that mean? It's our original nature, that's what he means by it, which is, why? Because it's an allusion to the old Adam that St. Paul talks about. The old Adam versus the new Adam. The old Adam is our, when we've talked about um, Protestant and Catholic, okay, and the idea of original sin, okay, according to the Catholic tradition, because it's based on St. Augustine, Original sin is the sin perpetrated by Adam and Eve in the garden that gets passed down 
to every generation through sex. And it's been thought by some because of that, that therefore it is sex that is ultimately the original sin. It's totally ludicrous. It's not what it's talking about at all, okay? But it's this idea that this thing gets passed down so that everybody who is born is born marked, so to speak. So sin is a, original sin is a sexually transmitted disease, Brad. It's a good way of putting it. According to St. Augustine, let's say, his, his mentality. That's why in the Orthodox Church, we call it the ancestral sin. The sin of the first ancestors. The Orthodox Church doesn't look at it as this, this quality of our lives. We look at it as a quality of the world in which we're born into. The world is diseased. Okay? It's not a judicial thing. It's not illegal. You sin. Judgment. It's you're sick. You need a physician kind of thing. Okay? So this, he's saying, our old stock cannot be overcome by what? Our, let's say, virtuous inoculation. I could go off on the pandemic, but I won't. The virtuous inoculation, the bringing in of the new stock. How, how do you do that new stock? Well, Protestant belief, Catholic belief. What does it mean to be virtuous? Protestant, let's go the, the extreme, the Calvinist perspective. You can't. There's no good. Why? Tea of tulip. Nope, that's unconditional election, <laughs> total depravity. That's taking this idea of Augustine and putting it on steroids, okay? Total depravity. Everything you do and everything you are is touched by sin. Some misinterpret that to mean everything about us is totally rotten and sinful. Like nothing you do has a tinge of goodness to it. That is likewise ludicrous, okay? Catholic side says, no, good works. You can be saved through good works, whether your own, other saints, or Jesus's. Okay, it's this thing super arrogation or something like that of the saints. The saints, Christians, by doing good works, think of this as a bank account. It's a bank account of good works. It's a tank of good works. If Heather does really good works, I know, I remember your name, more good works than she needs for her own salvation, those extra good works get put in this account. And Rook, who's a bit of a backslider, you know, He's got not quite enough. Well, you buy one of those indulgences that we've talked about, and those extra good works get applied. Bingo, saved. You make it to purgatory. All right? Jesus, who was perfect, and he filled this thing already to overflowing. It can never stop pouring out, so to speak. Right? The idea is we can overcome this by our and others' actions. What is Hamlet saying? He says, virtue, what is virtue? Virtue is doing those things that ultimately are good for us that we don't like to do. In other words, they're the things that the old part of us says, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to let that person take that parking spot because I'm running late. See, a sacrifice always involves my not getting something I want or need. If I'm not in a hurry, and I'm just, you know, la, 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 and I want a parking spot, but I don't, I'm not in a rush, and I let somebody else, that's not virtuous on my part. If it's I'm on my way to work, and somebody's got a broken car in front of me, a flat tire, and I stop and help them, that's a sacrifice. 
because that then does what to the rest of my day. <laughs> okay? Virtue cannot so inoculate. So is important there. It cannot so fix this. It cannot so wipe out, erase, bleach, original sin, but, well, but we shall relish of it. That is this. Anybody ever read the autobiography of Ben Franklin? Nobody. Surprised you didn't have to at some point. In there, because Franklin isn't a Christian, he's a deist. He tries to come up with a way to improve his life. Not financially, morally. And he literally comes up with a ledger-like system. I'm going to do these good things, and I'm not going to do these bad things. And after a while doing it, he realizes, I can't do that. Why? Because like, there's more bad things than he can get to. Okay? It's Mark, this is the cause for Mark Luther ultimately writing the 95 Theses and starting the Protestant Reformation. He couldn't so wipe this out with confession, according to his thinking, that he couldn't overcome it. Hamlet saying, I could be the best person in the world, and it doesn't wipe out. What's, what's at the root of this? Traditional Christian theology, both Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, all. The chief of this is what? The chief of this is what? Me. It's what I want, not what God wants. That's why in the garden, Garden of Gethsemane, just before the crucifixion, Christ had to do what? Pray, you know, bullets of sweat, so to speak, and take this from me. I don't want to drink this. I don't want to die. It's not the end of the story. What comes next? Yeah. Not what I want, but what you want. It's the fulfilling of what should have happened in the garden. I love you not. Why does he say I love you not right after that? What does that imply? See, the virtuous part up here is all about high-minded, platonic love, or holy love, chaste love, in marriage, let's get married and have sex all we want, love. I loved you not is skip the marriage, let's go get into bed. I was the more deceived. When was she the more deceived? When? Back when she loved him? When did this, when did this awareness of deception begin? Ophelia, sis, come on. Hamlet wants only one thing. Why? Projection. Oh, Polonius comes in. <laughs> you green girl. You speak like a green girl. Notice what Polonius says after this speech. I think it's after this speech. Take that back. It was earlier. He says to Ophelia, I have misquoted Hamlet. It was after the fishmonger speech. He says, I am sorry I did not quote him properly before. Quote, meaning, tell you what I think Hamlet meant. He says, this is the very ecstasy of love. Hamlet really does love you. And the reason he's gone mad is because she pulled back. She stopped allowing Hamlet to have, to use his language, commerce with her to talk with her. She slammed the doors closed. Okay? Wait. So when he says, I love you not the second time, it's in reference to loving her in the old style fashion? I think so. The question is, is he being honest? I don't think he is. I don't think anything Hamlet, well, 
Let me rephrase this. I think everything Hamlet says in this scene, from the beginning of Act One, when Hamlet first enters, it's all calculated. And that's because of how I understand the to be or not to be speech. It's not a soliloquy, because it can't be, because she's on the stage. And remember, why does Hamlet show up in that scene? He's been secretly sent for. Someone's told him, you are wanted in the lobby. Hamlet does. We don't know if Hamlet knows who wants him. I think it's very safe to say he doesn't believe it's Claudius and Polonius. But if he, if it is them, he has told them, and he walks out and doesn't see them, what are you going to do if you're Hamlet? Those little red warning lights are going to start flashing in your brain. Like, okay, where are they? Oh, they're in Sophia, daughter. I think from the moment Ham Hamlet steps foot onto the stage at the beginning of this speech, he's playing to an audience. And he knows Ophelia is not that audience. Who wants to hear Hamlet didn't really love Ophelia? Ophelia doesn't want to hear that. Polonius? Maybe. Claudius wants to hear it, right? Because he wants to know if he wants to the throne or what he's trying to So when Hamlet says, I'm not really in love with you, that must then mean what? There's some other cause for his madness. Hmm. I was the more deceived. Why does he then say, get thee to a nunnery? What did he tell Polonius in the fishmonger scene about his daughter? Let her not walk in the sun. Why? Because like a dead dog, a sun kissing carrion, she might conceive. Well, what happens if she gets to a nunnery? What doesn't happen? She won't conceive, okay? Get thee to a nunnery. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? Well, why must she be a breeder of sinners? This, it's it. Anyone who breeds is a breeder of sinners, according to the Augustinian notion. Huh. I am myself indifferent honest. That's like saying I'm mostly pregnant. Mm, no, you cannot be moderately virtuous or moderately chaste, not virtuous. You can't be kind of moderately virtuous, okay? You can't be moderately chaste. Either you are or you aren't. But yet I could accuse me of such things if it were better my mother had not borne me. And he gives us an example. Notice, he doesn't just leave that to our minds to fill in all the horrible... KGB-ish, you know, stuff Hamlet has going on internally. I'm proud. Why does he list that first? That is the chief sin. Sorry. That's the number one. Pride was the cause for the fall of Satan. What does Satan mean, the name? Adversary. What was Satan's real name? Lucifer. What does Lucifer mean? It is a great name. It is a fantastic, one of the most beautiful names ever. Bearer of light. That's what it means, bearer of light. But nobody's going to name their kid Lucifer today because, you know, it's got this kind of negative connotation. Like most Germans today still don't name their son Adolf. It's just, you know, mm. I'm very proud. Revengeful? Why would he say this to her? Ambitious? Again, why would he say that to just to Ophelia? Proud, revengeful, ambitious, ambitious, more offenses at my beck than I have thoughts to put them in. That is, ho oh, ho. Maybe I could tell you things or I could spout off possibilities. 
but I don't have enough words to. I used to tell, well, I'll tell you since I'm saying it by saying it. I used to tell students, you know, the KGB or Gestapo, if I were born in another age, I could, I could put them all to shame. I've thought of ways of torture. I've thought of ways of, you know, uh, terrorist incidents. I mean, if somebody really wanted to bring the United States to its knees, there are a number of things that could be done really easily without a lot of planning. You just have to have a hundred or a thousand people who are willing to die for a pointless cause. But it could be done. That's what Hamlet is getting at. C.S. Lewis, as I'm doing a talk on Lewis for a group over in Franklin in May. C.S. Lewis in one of his letters told this um, correspondent, the work he had the hardest time writing, excuse me, the work he, he least liked writing was screw tape letters. The work he most liked, this was before he finished all of his writing, was the novel Paralandra. Yeah. The reason he hated screw tape was because it was the easiest. He said all he had to do was turn off all his inhibitions. He just had to let the darkness within kind of peek its head out and have at it. He gave Satan the adversary inside voice. Okay, That's what he means. I have more um, thoughts to put them in imagination to give them shape or time to act them in. Notice. So he says, I have more fences at my back than I have thoughts to put them in. Imagination to give them shape because thoughts are up here. And what does the imagination do? It marshals them. It puts them into order. And then what do you do based upon those ideas that you formulate and, and crystallize in your mind? You act on them. He says, and I don't have time. Is he talking about the, uh, the multiple ways he's thought of killing his father-in-law? Uh, excuse me, stepfather? Maybe. Possibly. What should such fellows as I do crawling between earth and heaven? Notice, crawling, not standing upright, you know, shaking your fist at God. It's interesting because Lear is going to have a passage where Lear is going to talk about crawling like beetles and being the sport of the gods. Like an eight-year-old boy with a magnifying glass and an insect playing with it. Little personal, you know, background there. We are errant knaves, all of us. Errant. Do you have a, do you, is there a gloss down there? Nope. What does errant mean? Wandering. Wandering. Meandering. Not doing what? Not aiming for a destination. Not looking for a solution. Okay? We are errant knaves. All of, who's the we? Is he saying humanity generally? I don't think so. I think he's saying we, not you, we don't trust us. Why? Why do I think that? How does he begin the speech? Go to a nunnery. We're the ones who are going to get you pregnant. We're the ones who are going to cause you to be breeders of sinners. But if you're in a nunnery, not a problem. To a nunnery, go. So twice now. Why is he telling her this? What's it for? What's his purpose? What's his end game? Bingo. He is trying to protect her. Why? he loves her. This is Hamlet's way of saying, Ophelia. If you can't listen to what I'm saying, please get the vibes I'm sending you. I can't think of any other 
he's trying to protect her. Who might he have in his mind trying to protect her? Who else might he be thinking of? What else? True. I think he's got the picture of his mother. His quote unquote fallen mother in his mind. When, <clears throat> when his mother was married to his father, everything was fine. A lot of criticism that says Hamlet's problem with Gertrude's and Claudius' marriage, it's edible. Freud stuff. Hamlet wants to be the one in the incestuous sheets. Okay, I don't agree at all with that. You can understand it a little bit because he's emphasizing the incestuous stuff, but you have to be of a certain frame of mind. You must have a certain outlook on life for that to be the prime determinant. But you don't have to have that kind of mentality to say, Hamlet saying she's fallen from this. Her marriage to Hyperion, <laughs> to her rutting with a satyr, half man, half goat. Go to a nunnery. Believe none of us. Go to a nunnery. Where's your father? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Is it just to see what she'll say? But I mean, when I say why, what does her father have to do with anything he's been talking about? Well, he would be the one to send her to the letter, for one. Possibly, depending upon her age. We don't know Ophelia's age. We don't know Laertes' age. We do find out Hamlet's age in um, Act 5, Scene 1. Okay. Where is her father? He's, he's watching. He's listening. What does she say? At home. Does Hamlet know, no, not think, know that he is being watched? So this is, this is probably like, should this be a stage direction of like, he's like, hey, where's your dad? And like, he's like, at home. Could be. Because like, I would think that like he's smart enough to be like, hey, where's your dad? Facial expressions, body language. Okay, she's clearly lying. Like caught in it too. Like you're gonna be very, you know, you're gonna at least blush if you're like you're straight up lying after like a conversation. Or kind of piggybacking off what you're saying, like if he suspects maybe he's being spotted, he's like probably like sort of stare around to see where like they could possibly be hiding. Um, I, I I would you know, I would love to see a version of Hamlet where Hamlet can just kind of, you know, if he's talking to Ophelia, he just kind of looks around, where's your father? And how does she respond? Does she respond immediately? At home, my lord. Or does she pause and glance to where she saw her father and Claudius go? Let the doors be shut upon him that he may play the fool nowhere but in his own house. Again, why say that to Ophelia? And notice she doesn't go, why do you ask, my lord? To, to me, this makes no sense unless Hamlet, he doesn't know for sure, that's clear. He has a really good guess, I, I think because of being sent for, okay? Let the doors be shut upon him that he may play the fool nowhere but in his own house. What does he mean, play the fool? He's in charge of the play. Polonius is only in charge of play. He's trying to warn her about what's happening with his father. Okay, what else? I think you're right. Who else is he trying to warn? The way I read this is this is a warning to Polonius. I, again, I think Hamlet knows he's being watched. And I think this is Hamlet's subtle way of saying, Polonius, get the hell.
hell out of my business. Stay inside. You can play a fool in your own home. Why? Because you can't get hurt. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff behind closed doors. Farewell. Oh, help him, you sweet heavens. Why? Two implications. Either she's saying help him, him being Hamlet, or, but if that were true, it would likely be an aside. But if it's to her father, it means that she has some inkling of what Hamlet's trying to tell her. Possibly. Would the first one have to be an aside? I'm, after all, she's been doing what? She's been walking, carrying that prayer book, praying, and she just, you know, oh, help him, sweet heavens. Think suddenly Hamlet needs prayer? I think that's likely. And I think also it's an indication, could be a verbal stage kind of indication, of something about Hamlet's demeanor. She realizes he's gone. Probably thinking, why did he bring up my father? Just like Polonius, when Hamlet calls Polonius a fishmonger, have you a daughter? And Polonius says, that's that, harping about my daughter again. Well, help him, you sweet heavens. If thou dost marry, it's like, even after Hamlet says farewell, it's like, I'm not saying this is the case, it's almost like Hamlet it almost becomes unaware, unaware of Ophelia being there. He's obviously aware because he's talking to her. What he says applies only to her. But it's also almost like when she speaks, he doesn't hear it. And he's just going on like he's on a roll. Like nobody could ever shut off, stop, either Jonathan Winters or Robin Williams when they entered the zone, so to speak. It was just, you gotta stand back and let those forces of nature have at it. And when the two of them were together, happened a few times, watch out. If thou dost marry, so if you're not gonna go to a nunnery, I'll give thee this plague for thy dowry. Now what's a dowry? It's what a wife, excuse me, a bride brings to the marriage. Usually a pot of money from the father, okay? He says, I'm gonna give you this. It can also be the blessing, but he's giving a plague instead. Be thou as chaste as ice, right? Nobody wants to sleep with ice. What phrase do we use to describe women like this? Used to use, not used hardly at all anymore. Frigid, okay? Be thou as chaste as ice, probably come from this if not another source, as pure as snow, right? Snow when it falls, pure, white, all that kind of stuff. Thou shalt not escape calumny. What's calumny? A bad reputation. This is to women, not to men. Mm -hmm. Money wise calls it uh, slander or slander. Mm -hmm. With bad reputation is often slander, okay? Get thee to a nunnery. Why? Because then you won't have this happen. Farewell. Or if you must marry, marry a fool. For wives men know well enough what monsters you make of them. And Shakespeare's playing on this old medieval notion that every man who gets married gets cheated on by his wife. Which is why Puck says to be one in a million in a loyal relationship, faithful relationship, that's something. And then in, what is it, in one of the Henry IV, it's one in 10,000, I think, or maybe or maybe that was here. It's, it's that idea, why? Because this, there was this notion in the Middle Ages, Chaucer plays upon this, that women had insatiable sexual appetites. So, wife of Bath's tale, as an example. The wife of Bath's tale, the wife of Bath, it's kind of like, you know, she had a turnstile on her door for the men to come in, take a number, you know. The fool, the, the being made monsters of, 
That's the metaphorical horns that the cuckold, the man whose wife cheats on him, puts on his head. And so you actually had, during the Corpus Christi plays and other you know, um, saints days and such in the Christian calendar, you had shows, plays of sorts, where men would come out with these horns on their head because they're portraying the men who are being cheated on by their wives. Why? Where's the idea originate from? It goes back to Genesis. Adam wouldn't have fallen were it not for Eve, who brought woe to man. Popular etymology for woman. Woe to man. Not popular today, Middle Ages. So, go to a nunnery. Quickly! Why quickly? You never know when you might conceive, you know. Farewell, heavenly powers, restore him. And he's not done. Notice she's not speaking to him. She, Help him, God. I have heard of your paintings, too. Well enough. Not like she's, you know, Christina Rossetti. Not that kind of painting. Makeup. God hath given you one face, that is, you've got the face you're born with, and you make yourselves another. You make, you look something you are not. You jig, that is, you dance, you amble, you walk, the sachet, you know, the swiveling of the hips, and you lisp. Apparently lisping was a common of some sort then. You nickname God's creatures and make your wantonness your ignorance. Have you ever glossed there? You prance about frivolously and speak with affected coyness. You put new labels on God's creatures by your use of cosmetics. And you excuse your affectations on the grounds of pretended ignorance. Your affectations. That's a nice, benign, no meaning word. What is meant by wantonness? Keep going. It's not just desire. It's lived out desire. It's sexual proclivity, sexual looseness. You make your sexual um, proclivity, is the only word I can think of, your ignorance. That is, it's like, oh, well, I'm just, I can't help myself. I'm... Go to, I'll know more on it. That is, I'm done, I, 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 I gotta stop. Why? It hath made me mad. Think you women, you're the cause of all the. I say we will have no more marriage. Those that are married already, all but one, shall live. So everybody in the play that's married, we don't know who that is, but they'll live except for one. Who's the one? Claudius. He's not going to live. Or it could be one marriage won't live. Yes. Everything that he says right here is mentioned by Polonius, the king, and the queen right before he enters. Explain. So, like, the queen alludes to possibly, so shall I hope your virtues will bring you to this wanted way again to both your honors, right? Allusion to marriage. And to this. Yes. And then he says, God hath given you one face, and you make yourselves another. Polonius says that with devotion's visage and pious action, you do sugar or the devil himself. And then he says, I say we will have no more marriage. So he's saying to his mother, whatever his mother might, it, it, it gives reason to believe that Hamlet heard what they were talking about before he ever enters the stage. It's an interesting possibility. I've never considered that before. I had considered the, you know, it mimics, it mirrors the earlier speech. Um, yeah, it's, it is <clears throat> Diddy here. I have to think about that more. Those that are married already, all but one shall live. The rest shall keep as they are to a nunnery. How many times does he tell her to go to a nunnery? I think that's the third or fourth. And then Hamlet leaves. Ophelia is alone on the stage, except for wherever Claudius and Polonius are. But visually, she's the only one on the stage. Soliloquy. 
in that sense. Oh, what a noble mind is here overthrown. What does she mean? Him was crazy. He is bad, you know what, just crazy. The courtier soldier scholars, eye, tongue, sword. That is, the courtiers, eye, tongue, sword. The scholars, eye, tongue, sword. The soldiers. That is, he is the epitome of what every courtier, every soldier, and every scholar wants to be. Hamlet is the model. The expectancy in Rose of the Fair State, expectancy like the people in Henry's time look to how once he becomes king to be this great king. By the way, I didn't mention it you know, before. Henry V, how becomes Henry V? He was regarded as the greatest English king. He wasn't called Henry the Great. There was only one the great in English history. That was Alfred. The expectancy and rows of the fair state, the glass of fashion, what is the purpose of a play? Hold a mirror up to nature. The glass of fashion is the mirror of fashion. That is, people looked at Hamlet and they're like, oh, I'm going to dress like him. Which is why it's so weird when he shows up in her room with his doublet unbraced and his stockings down and everything. The observed of all observers. What is she saying about Elsinore, the town where the castle is, and ultimately all of Denmark? What does apparently nobody in this city slash country do? Mm. No. Mind their own blanking business. They're always doing what? What are you doing over here? What are you doing over there? It's a panopticon. With the only difference being, who's at the center of the panopticon? I almost said Falstaff. Hal, not Hal, Hamlet. <laughs> Hamlet kind of, Hal kind of. Hamlet, he's the one, he's in the fishbowl. And everybody's outside looking in, but they're also looking at each other. That's why I said early on, you know, one of the themes is this idea of spying. And you have multiple kinds of spying. You've got spying, you've got eavesdropping, you've got watching, you've got looking, you've got observing. Who's there? The question begins the play. It's this looking, okay? The observed of all observers quite, quite down. And I of ladies most deject and wretched. Why she? the most deject and wretched of all ladies. Why is it Gertrude? Because she's got her second love. Ophelia? That sucked the honey of his music vows. His vows were like music. What did that mean? She sucked the honey out of them. Honey's nutritious. It's not just sweet. She's like, I fed on his vows. He had her hook, line, and sinker, in other words. Now see that noble and most sovereign reason. Like sweet bells, jangled. Not harmonious, not beautiful music. Jangled out of tune and harsh, that unmatched form, that is Hamlet's, his physical form, she is saying. In feature of blown youth, blasted with ecstasy. Why ecstasy? Elvis has left the building. His mind has left his body. Not that he's dead, but he is beyond repair in her thinking. That is why she is most dejected and wretched. To have seen what I have seen, see what I see. What's the to see what I have seen referred to? Of course, she went to that room. And to see, to have seen Hamlet in 
is prime. To have seen Hamlet as he was when everybody else looked to him. When all the, it's implied, when all the other young women looked at Hamlet and were like, oh, I'm falling. And she was in the orbit of his star, even though her father and brother said, no, you're not. To have seen what I've seen, see what I see. Present tense. Hamlet like this, to Hamlet like this. Why is it a good thing JFK was assassinated? I know, that sounds like a horrible thing to say. Murder? Talking to the president? No, why was it a good thing, oh, a good thing. that he was assassinated? Oh. Cuba. Now, I'm not talking politics. Imagine if Kennedy had lived and all the stuff that we now know about Kennedy had come out while he was still alive. Sleeping with White House aides, bringing in Hollywood starlets, the whole nine yards. The drugs, I mean, lots of drugs. He was on painkillers all the time from his experience in World War II. Okay. PT boat uh, operator, he got injured. I mean, he was basically, basically in pain all, the whole time, unless it was like on like a cocktail of drugs. Oh, he, and he was on a cocktail drug the whole time. I mean, yeah. But huh. all that great oratory, that's not what you can do for your country, but your country, blah, blah, blah. Sorry, that's not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I did an Al Gore there, which I completely messed up. Um, <laughs> if he had lived all of that stuff, would have come out. Instead, when he died, what immediately happened? He was sainted. There was this apotheosis, okay? What would have happened if Roosevelt had died before the New Deal? He would not be regarded as one of the top three presidents. Okay, not at all. She is saying, to have seen Hamlet like this, and now, He's a shell. King comes in with Polonius. Love and his affections do not that way tend. Meaning, Hamlet is not crazy for love. Nor what he spake, though it lacked form a little, was not like madness. Again, what does he mean? Hamlet's not crazy. Say what you want about Claudius. He's not an idiot. He's a Machiavellian. He understands what? He understands the rules that Henry IV laid down for his son. He understands how actions and behavior do what? Can sway public perception. He's telling us this is a game. Is it any accident that the play within the play that we're going to see in a few moments, assuming we get to it, has two titles, one of which is literal, refers to historical information, the murder of Gonzago, within the world of the play. And the other one, what's the other title of the play within the play? The Mouse Trap. Who's the mouse? <laughs> Who's the trap or the cat? The kitten. Nor would he speak the lack form a little was not like madness. There's something in his soul or which his melancholy sits on brood. I love that line. Hamlet's melancholy, his deliberative, meditative personality, sits on whatever this is in his soul to do what? If it sits on brood, what is that a metaphor of? The hen on eggs. Why does the hen sit on the eggs? To hatch them. Mm. Earlier, he said, madness and great ones must not go unwatched. Uh, Claudius said that about Hamlet. And I do doubt the hatch and the disclose will be some danger. I do doubt means I expect. Which to prevent, 
I haven't quit determination, thus set it down. He shall with speed, oh, it's coming up, the madness and great ones. Um, he's going to England. Why is he sending him to England? Two purposes, one public, the other one private. Public to demand tribute. This is the time when England owes tribute to Denmark. It's during the Viking period, okay? That's the public one. The private one at this point is what? To get Hamlet away from the castle, to get him in some good, clean, fresh, salt air, change of scenery, change of environment, maybe it'll bring him back to a census. It's going to be later that the secret reason for Hamlet going to England is to kill him. Not yet, okay? He asked Polonius, what do you think, Polonius? It shall do well. I still think of the problem, however, the origin and commencement of his grief sprung from neglected love. Notice, neglected. How's Hamlet's love been neglected? From this time forth, be more reserved of yourself, he tells Ophelia. Don't let Hamlet into your room. Don't talk to Hamlet. Don't receive letters from Hamlet. You need not tell us Ophelia, either she doesn't come in because she's been on the stage. So when they're saying this, where is she? Do they walk right up next to her and talk? Or do they come in one door and she's still standing over there and she kind of slowly ambles her way over? How now, Ophelia? You need not tell us what Lord Hamlet said. We heard it all. Not a soliloquy then. Or does that we heard it all only refer to most of y'all? Uh, it refers to all. Do as you please, my lord. It's like Claudius is probably going, really? Thank you, Claudius, uh, Polonius, for giving me leave to do what I want to do as the king. He said, but if you hold it fit, after the play, let his queen mother all alone entreat him to show his grief. Let her be round with him. That is, let her really prod him to get out what he's hiding. And I'll be placed, so please you, in the ear of all their conference. I'm going to listen to everything. It's kind of interesting, though. I'll be placed in the ear. Where have we seen something placed in the ear earlier? Poison into Claudius's, uh, Hamlet Sr.'s ear by Claudius. He says, if she can't get the reason, then send them to England. Okay, it shall be so. Why? Madness and great ones not un must not unwatched go. So, 3-2. Sorry, I thought we would get a lot farther than that. 3-2. Um, very briefly, Hamlet's second speech to the actors. This is often read, well, the first speech and the second speech are often read partially at least as Shakespeare talking to actors performing his plays. So Shakespeare telling the fellow actors in his acting group, don't screw up my lines. For example, if you mouth it, as many of our players do, I had as leap the town crier spoke my line. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand. Don't use all these wild gesticulations, he said. Okay? Speak the speech, I pray you, going back to the beginning, as I pronounced it to you. He's telling the actors, read it like I just read it. You know, Mel Brooks has a famous... Um, gaff that he likes to you. It's kind of a walk this way thing. Uses it in Young Frankenstein, uses it in minute, uh, Robin Hood Men in Tights where somebody walks this way and everybody else says, that's what Shakespeare is saying. Pronounce it the way I told you to pronounce it, okay? But I think the more important part, second speech, where he tells us what is the purpose of drama. But you know what the root for drama means in Greek, which is where it comes from? mimic. Drama is a mimicking of what? Us. 
It's a mimicking of life. It's an imitation. Notice, doesn't mean a bad imitation. It's a representation of lives. So Hamlet says, the purpose of playing whose end, both at the first ancient Greece and now, was and is to hold as twere the mirror up to nature. <coughs> well, what's the nature? It's us. It's to show us how we behave. In other words, as with ancient Greek drama, and Aristotle talks about this a lot in his little book on poetics, which is about drama, we should see ourselves in these characters. We should see how, especially with tragedy, we should see how, use a standard phrase, but for the grace of God, there go I. That if I were put in the same situation, for example, as Oedipus, what would have stopped me from making Oedipus' mistake? I mean, you're told. You're going to kill your father and sleep with your mother. You love your father and mother. You live with them, you think. What do you do? You get as far away as fast as you can. The problem? Oedipus didn't know his father and mother weren't his father and mother. If he knew they weren't his real father and mother, stay there the rest of your life. No problem. Okay? Told a mirror up to nature to show virtue her feature. That is to portray what virtuous behavior looks like. Scorn her image. That is to show what scorn should be, should look like. In the very age and body of the time, his form and pressure. Someone, I don't remember if it was this class or another one, um, I think it was this morning, said something, in fact it was Heather, um, something about why don't you see Shakespeare's plays performed in Elizabethan dress. dress. Elizabethan dress. Well, that's Shakespeare's time. That's not our time. So why can't we have Romeo and Juliet dressed like us? We can. Does that mean you have to go the full Bos Lerman, you know, Miami drug lords and the whole? <laughs> no, not necessarily. But, you know, some of the greatest productions of certain plays, I'm thinking of one of Antigone was done in the 1940, 1941, I think it was 41, by Jean Alouis, great playwright in his own right, in occupied Paris. And the Nazis were too stupid to get it. They didn't see that crayon was a representation of this totalitarian Nazi attitude. Okay? And Antigone was this great underground fighter. I mean, and he pulled it off without getting killed. Okay, so go on. Um, Hamlet speaks to Horatio, lines 59 and following. Um, he praises Horatio. He thanks Horatio for sticking with him. And, you know, he says, I chose you. My soul chose you. Uh, she has sealed thee for herself, for thou hast been as one in suffering all, all that suffers nothing. That is, you don't suffer, but because you've stuck with me, you have suffered. Uh, blessed are those whose blood and judgment are so well commettled that they are not piped for fortune's finger to sound what stop she please. Notice what Hamlet has just done. He's introduced an image that the play is going to bring up later, that Shakespeare is going to bring up play later. Players with recorders, and then Hamlet's going to use that image of the recorder against Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Okay? So he says, give me that man, line 70, that is not passion's slave. And I will wear him in my heart's core, I in my heart of heart, as I do thee. The man that is not passion slave, in one sense, is a stoic. 
And that's another reason why many critics have interpreted Horatio as a Stoic. The, the Stoic mentality said, you want to live a good life? Here's how to live a good life. Don't suffer the highs of emotion and passion, and don't suffer the lows. Just live on an even keel. It's kind of a California surfer dude mentality, you know? Just ride the wave you're on, man. Just, it's the dude from Big Lebowski. It's just cruise. That's it. Because if you suffer the highs, what's going to happen? That wave will crash. <laughs> and then you go down below where you were. Which is why it is best to be around fortune's middle. Okay? So, two more minutes. Everybody comes in for the play within the play. Gertrude goes, Hamlet, sit here. Come hither, my dear Hamlet, sit by me. He goes, no, good mother, here's metal more attractive. And he points to Ophelia, Polonius, daughter. Hamlet, lady, shall I lie in your lap? He lies down at her feet. Line 110. On stage, Hamlet often lies at Ophelia's feet, but he could instead offer to do this and continue to stand. And in some instances, he puts her his head in her lap. Okay? Shall I lie in your lap? No, my lord. Why? Because you dirty little bugger. She understands the double entendre. Not lie, but lie in your lap. I, I mean, my head upon your lap. I, my lord, that is, I know what you mean, but even that my head in your lap is a double entendre. Doesn't only have to mean this head. Do you think I'm in Country Matters? And in Shakespeare's day, I've worked on hundreds of medieval, of Renaissance manuscripts when I was an editor for the Dun Very Orn. In Shakespeare's day, the word country is spelled a host of ways. Why? No standard spelling at all. One of the most common ones, <laughs> C-U-N-T-R-Y. And that's why he says, do you think I meant country matters? Because country, as in like state, makes no sense if you read it that way. She says, I think nothing, my lord. Feminist critics have hated that line. Why? Because it implies Ophelia is a zero. I don't mean a zero, a nil. I mean a zero, like, a, like this. Something to be filled in. Start going double and triple entendre. Hammer, that's a fair thought to lie between maid's legs. Now, does that mean that's a fair thought, colon, to lie between a maid's legs? No because there's no colon. What is, my lord, Hamlet? Nothing. Bear in mind, in Shakespeare's day, the word nothing was pronounced no ting. Like no ting. The H was silent. What's he saying? Again, more double entendre. How do you represent nothing? A zero, a hole. That's a fair thought, a hole between maid's legs. His mother's probably going, Hamlet, stop. We're in public, you know. You are married, my lord. In other words, Ophelia gets it. <laughs> Who, I? Eh. So, the play begins, and we're going to have to stop there because it's 926, and we'll come back to, wake up. We'll come back to the play within the play Thursday. We may not finish Hamlet. I thought we would have gotten farther than this. Um, we're actually going to pick up quite a ways into the play, around line 259 or so. All right, if you haven't turned in your paper, turn in your paper. Don't forget, Thursday, turn in your papers.